Good evening, everybody. My name is Gabriel Kelly, and I'm the director of the Adelaide Thinkers in Residence program, and I welcome you here tonight. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on Ghana land, and we value and acknowledge and recognise the, the, the spiritual beliefs of the Ghana people. So this is the opening lecture of Adelaide Thinker in Residence, Dr. Martin Seligman, and to the residency entitled, Wellbeing and Resilience, Building a Flourishing State. Welcome, Dr. Seligman, and to your family, Mandy, and the girls, Carly and Jenny. Welcome too to Miss Amy Walker, a research associate of Dr. Seligman's from Pennsylvania University. Good evening, Minister Hill. Good evening, Your Excellency Rear, Rear Admiral Scarce, Governor of South Australia, and Mrs. Scarce. Welcome particularly to our Seligman Residency partners and welcome honoured guests all, including people in schools and homes across South Australia who are watching this live and online. Please join in on the global discussion on Twitter tonight if you're so inclined. The Twitter hashtag for the residency is hash flourish SA. Well, what a blockbuster turnout. We've had to move venues, as you know, to cope with this unprecedented demand, and we hope that we didn't put anyone out. We did send a bus to pick up anyone who hadn't quite got the message, but we hope it hasn't inconvenienced you. Many of you know that the Adelaide Thinkers in Residence program exists to find new solutions to difficult problems that we face, or to find new ways to unlock opportunity for our future. The methodology we do we use to do this involves deciding on the challenge that we think is important, finding the best or one of the best people in the world to help us tackle it, and attracting a group of partners who invest in the residency to guide it forward and implement the recommendations over a four to five year period. Over the nine years of the program, we've tackled 23 serious issues, sustainability, manufacturing, water, early childhood development, <coughs> pardon me, road safety, homelessness, and science education, just to name a few. We have done the hard work of change. We are a deliberate mechanism for systems change and the innovation that follows. We are also incredibly results focused. Because of this program, the state, um, the state has, has, has produced the most renewable energy of any state in Australia and it leads the nation in tackling homelessness and other states are following our lead. Our work has also led to three new organisations. The Australian Centre for Social Innovation, the RI Oz, which keeps building our appetite and capacity for science education. And then we systematically extend the impetus of the thinkers' work, Professor Laura Lee and Mr. Fred Hansen, through the Integrated Design Commission and through the work of the State Architect and the Urban Renewable Authority, which will be launched soon. So our recommendations turn into results and we are dedicated in pursuit of that outcome. This program helps to keep South Australia dynamic and helps us to modernise. We have tilled the ground of our state's psyche so that we're more open to new ideas and, and we can better respond to opportunities in the future. The residency of Dr. Martin Seligman couldn't have gone ahead, though, without our incredible and committed partners. And please bear with me, I'd like to be a bit specific here because it's so important to us. The Department of Education and Child Development were the first on board, followed by the powerful engagement of St Peter's College Adelaide, who are simultaneously working with Dr Seligman and systematically introducing positive education into their school. SA Health, through the involvement of their mental health executives, is a significant partner, along with Catholic Education SA, the Smith Family, Beyond Blue, the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, the REACH Foundation, Adelaide University, Flinders University, and the University of South Australia. We're particularly pleased to welcome PricewaterhouseCoopers on board as a sponsor this time. So all of you, thank you for your commitment and leadership on behalf of the people of South Australia. I welcome you especially tonight, the leaders and executives from all our partner and government agencies. To the Chief Executive and the 100 teachers and educators from the Department of Education and Child Development, welcome. To the Headmaster and Board of St Peter's College Adelaide and 80 members of your school community, welcome to you. To the Principal and 70 members from the Mount Barker High School community who will be working in collaboration with St Peter's College over the life of the residency, I say welcome tonight too. And to the group of 30 education and health leaders and others from Adelaide's northern suburbs who I think came in by bus together, thanks for coming. And to other partner chief executives and CEOs, good evening to you. And of course, I welcome all other principals and teachers who are here tonight. I really welcome the psychologists who've come, the psychiatrists among us, the social workers, mediators, academics in psychology, mental health and teaching disciplines, and to the Australian Psychological Association. 
And of course, the absolute partners in this residency are all the parents and grandparents and aunties and uncles who are passionate about South Australia's children's well-being. Personally, I'd like to say that I wish to offer a special welcome to Ms Jeanne Mazur, my first and treasured mother-in-law, who introduced me to the important knowledge in the field of psychology, and to South Australian practitioners par excellence, Rosemary Taylor and Joy Allen, whose psychological guidance and skills have helped me navigate the challenges of family and life. I'm sure that among you, you can remember dedicated professionals who've helped you in this way that I received help. So just as the whole human project is an evolving one, so, in the, so is the territory of research leading to new science and the reframing of old ideas and understandings. Many scientific fields overturn or renew themselves as new ideas are tested and accepted. The science of positive psychology is relatively new in time, but it brings forward some fundamentally new ideas and methods which can be applied to the well-being of citizens, the success of societies and business, and to the art of being human in a society, in a healthy society. Now we here in South Australia, we, we know we have a great quality of life. We love that about our state and ourselves. In 2011, The Economist magazine noted Australia to be the most livable country in the OECD, and the Property Council National Survey confirmed Adelaide last year as the most livable city in Australia. This means that many consider us to be the most livable city in the most livable country in the world. And we're also cited, in some scores, as the 30 most livable city, so it depends which survey you're looking at. But whatever the score, we are proud of the quality of our lives here. We really value that about South Australia. And yet, Beyond Blue alerts us that one in five of us in Australia will experience episodes of depression in our own lifetimes. One in four of us experience one type or other of anxiety disorder. Suicide rates are still high. More than 2,000 Australians take their lives every year. And 25% of Australia's young people experience symptoms of depression, with 14% of young people symptoms of anxiety, and 13% engaged in substance abuse. So many South Australians are not thriving, despite the relative wealth of our state and our country. Now, South Australia and Australia too are said to have a relatively low productivity. And some are of the view that our children are not universally doing well, although, of course, many are doing fabulously, but not universally doing well at school. And I often hear, and this is just hearsay and this is just me, but I often hear South Australians speaking of a kind of negativity which fells tall poppies, which stops innovation, slows entrepreneurial activity, and has a kind of glass, half-empty feel. So what can we do to protect our young people? What can we do to help strengthen our population and young ones in particular so that when the ordinary crises of life hit, they have the resilience to cope? What can we do to protect our young people against the scourge of mental illness? How can we interest our society in the brightness of our future rather than focusing on the pains of our past? These are questions which lead us to the offerings of positive psychology and the aim of wellbeing and resilience. The opportunity sitting behind these questions, though, is the chance to broaden the idea of quality of life beyond income, food, wine and beaches, which we love, but to how people feel in their lives, how people direct and unfold their lives, and how they envision and achieve their futures, and how they feel a valued part of society and fit within it. This aspect of quality of life has been often ignored in many spheres. But I think it's a rich seam of undiscovered wealth and energy, at least as valuable as any mining boom, and it's totally renewable. How to tap it is one of the aims of this residency on wellbeing and resilience, building a flourishing state. And Dr. Martin Seligman is a giant in this field. He has worked on positive psychology, learned helplessness, depression and pessimism in the past 15 years. His studies have also moved into fields of optimism. Since 2000, though, his main mission has been the promotion of the field of positive psychology. This discipline includes the study of positive emotion, positive character traits, and positive institutions. And of course, many of you will have been reading the books that he's produced over many years, Learned Helplessness, the recent book published Flourish, and a number of other major titles which I know sit in many of your bookshelves, particularly those of you who are parents and teachers. For 14 years, Dr. Seligman was the director of the clinical training program of the psychology department of the University of Pennsylvania. He's a past president of the Division of Clinical Psychology of the American Psychological Association 
and he's the scientific director of Foresight Inc., a testing company which predicts success in various walks of life. He's currently professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, and he works with governments and corporations around the world. Dr. Seligman will be giving about an hour's talk, a little under, Musi. Um, he'll be speaking to us for about that time and his presentation will be followed by uh, your questions which we will take down the front here and I'll give you some instructions about that towards the end. Um, I might note though that we won't have more than 20, 20 minutes or so for questions and so we won't be able to take more than about 12 and we'll also be receiving questions uh, from the people who are watching this online. This is Dr Seligman's introductory lecture to his residency. Martin, welcome to South Australia. And if now, if you'd like to come up onto the stage, I'd love you to tell us about your important work. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply grateful to Gabriella Kelly and to your new uh, Premier uh, for inviting us to South Australia. Um, what I want to talk about tonight is, as an individual, as a state, as a nation, what's the most you can hope for in life? Um, it's a more poignant question than you might think, because the tradition out of which most of us come really comes out of uh, Freud and Schopenhauer, who told us the best you could ever do in life was not to be miserable, not to suffer. So the highest goal you could have was uh, to adjust uh, your life to get to zero. But when you, when you lie in bed at night, by and large, you're not thinking of how to go from minus eight to minus two in life. You're, you're thinking about how to go from plus two to plus six. And there um, hasn't until recently been an articulated science of what, what that might be. So I want to tell you something about the science and practice. And I, and I want to consider the question that as individuals, you can do a lot better than zero. Any any institution, any life, any politics that is just aimed at decreasing your misery, the best you can ever get to, if even if it's com completely successful, is zero. And I'm going to suggest there's m much more than that. That, that the Freud-Schopenhauer view is empirically false, that people can do much better in life than not to suffer. I'm going to suggest it's, it's morally insidious, and that it's a political dead end. So that, that's where I'm going to go tonight. You know, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what happens. Um, so here, here's an outline of uh, uh, what I want to do. Um, I, I've just suggested that well-being itself, not just the absence of misery, can be an individual goal and a plausible state and national goal. And um, I don't know if we have a positive human future ahead of us. Many people think not. Uh, it's uh, not something I, I can confidently predict. But if there is to be a positive human future, uh, in what might it consist? So I'm going to talk about what is it, more precisely, in your own life you would want to build if you were to have well-being. And... Um, uh, then it turns out there's been a remarkable question, it turns out to be measurable, and it's been measured in 23 European countries, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. So that's the question of what we would want to build, and then the question is, um, can well-being be built, or is it one of those things, uh, dieting, as you probably know, is a scam. It's a a uh, $50 billion scam in the United States. It's, it's a scam of the following sort, that uh, any of you can lose 5% uh, of your body weight in about three weeks by uh, following any diet on the bestseller list. Uh, I did the watermelon diet, and I lost 20 pounds in three weeks. I, I had diarrhea for three weeks. Uh, um, 
Yeah, but the problem about dieting is that 85 to 95 percent of people regain all that weight or more over the next three to five years. So the well-being question in some ways is very similar. Is this something you can permanently change or can only do a boost and will it go back to zero? So it, it turns out that there is increasing evidence that you can actually have more of what I'm going to suggest well-being consists of in your life and uh, uh, non-transiently. So I'm going to talk, what I'm going to do is, is some of you probably think that uh, uh, your minister, your uh, Sunday school teacher, your grandmother uh, knew it all and that there's nothing new here. Well, so what I'm going to do in the bulk of this is to take you through the five elements of well-being, PERMA, positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment, and tell you something that I didn't know 10 years ago, something that the science has told us, and something that's known about how to build these things. So that's the interior of the talk. Then, and that's about individuals. I'm a psychologist. I've spent my life working with individuals. But then the question arises, can you build well-being in something more than the individual? And I'm going to tell you about uh, work in schools around the world, and one of the reasons I'm here is uh, the kind uh, hospitality of St. Peter's College Adelaide, in which uh, the vision of building a school centered on well-being. And um, then I'll tell you the largest endeavor to increase well-being that's uh, been done, that I've been involved in, and it's a story of the U.S. Army. It's a story starts three years ago in which the uh, chief of staff says, I want to create an army that's just as psychologically fit as it is physically fit. And I'll tell you that story. And uh, I'll say a little bit about measurement, both in individuals and statewide, nationwide. And, and uh, then I want to talk about uh, how this could happen in South Australia and really why I'm here at this time. And finally, I want to talk about the politics of well-being. This is political. It's a different kind of politics. It's not a politics of left or right. It's a politics of change of political goals. So that's, that's what we'll try to do over the next 50 minutes or so. Uh, so the first question is, what is this well-being stuff? And um, uh, many of us believe that a, a good way of looking at what's north of zero, north of indifference, has five different elements. And the first one is, is uh, what I, whenever I talk to press, I say, please don't put the smiley face on the cover. I was delighted that the advertiser today did not put the smiley face uh, on it. But it is the question of positive emotion and uh, uh, happiness, rapture, comfort, joy, and I'm very interested in those things, the question of how to measure them and how to build it, but positive psychology doesn't end there. The, the second ingredient of positive psychology is uh, engagement, flow, being one with the music. So the house lights are up enough so I can see the first dozen rows, and it looks to me that about 70% of you uh, are one with the music now, that you're uh, uh, wrapped up listening in what I'm saying. The other 30% of you are having sexual fantasies, by the way. <laughs> this is well documented. So uh, we're interested in the question of uh, uh, measuring flow, measuring engagement, and how in schools, in the workplace, in your love relationships, in what you care about, you can have more of that. So we'll talk about that. Uh, the third element of well-being, to my way of thinking, is positive relationships. Uh, and the question, can you have better relationships than you do now? And it turns out there have been a couple of discoveries, one of which I think will surprise you, and techniques that children, people in corporations, uh, can learn. So um, we'll talk about the R relationships. The, the fourth element, and uh, notice these are different from smiley-faced elements, is uh, meaning and purpose in life. And 
for me, uh, that's um, belonging to and serving something you think is bigger than you are. And uh, I'll tell you something about uh, research on this and uh, the question of can, can one have more meaning and purpose in life. And the fifth uh, element, the A, is accomplishment. Uh, so, um, PERMA is the uh, acronym for this. Um, and uh, the uh, two important things about PERMA, uh, if I was giving this talk 20 years ago, and I'm going to suggest toward the end that the measurement of PERMA is a good state and national goal. And if I had suggested that 20 years ago, people would have said, well, dollars are measurable, but well-being is not. So it turns out each of these things is measurable. Uh, I have a website that's free. It's called authentichappinessoneword.org. And it talks about, it, it has on it the 20 leading tests of these variables of well-being. And you're, they're free. You can take them. Uh, if you want to know, um, about two and a half million people have registered at the website and taken it. So if you actually want to know what your sense of humor is relative to other Australians, you can find out actually, sort of percentiles about this. And then the, the dieting question occurs. Um, it turns out each of these things is buildable. And part of the reason I never worked, I, I spent my life working on misery. Uh, trauma, helplessness, depression, suicide. And part of the reason I didn't work on well-being is there was a study about 35 years ago which looked at lottery winners in Illinois. And it basically measured the smiley face, how happy they were. And it followed them. And it turns out when you win the lottery, you get happier. But about three months later, you're back to the, your usual curmudgeonly self. And so I said, well, I didn't want to work on anything as uh, transient as that. Well, it turns out that's not representative of this. And positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment are probably buildable in lasting ways. Uh, One of the inspirations for the question of measuring well-being is work that happened about a year ago uh, in Cambridge, Felicia Huppert and Timothy So, and they asked the question, could you compare nations to each other for well-being? And um, um, by the way, there's, there's quite a lot of data on the smiley face, on life satisfaction and positive emotion across nationally, and you probably know Australia typically ranks between 5th and 10th, depending on what you're met. Denmark's always at the top. But there is not permadata on either the United States or Australia, and I'll talk about why toward the end, but there is permadata on all of Europe now. And the important thing here is that it differs. This is a survey of uh, uh, at least 2,000 adults in each of 23 European nations in which you use criteria of positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and sense of accomplishment. And what you find is Denmark is, uh, again, up there at the top. Uh, almost 40% of Danish adults are uh, high perma, are flourishing. Uh, and uh, in the middle, places like the UK, it's uh, uh, about 20%, and at the bottom are the former uh, Soviet nations, uh, typically uh, around 10%. So what this tells us is this stuff is measurable, and there are huge differences uh, just across Europe. Um, so that then leads us to the question I work on most of the time. Given that we can measure PERMA, in adults, and I'll talk about children toward, toward the end of uh, the lecture, can it change, and how does it change, and what does some of the science look like in individuals? And then I'll turn to the question of organizations. Um, so let me talk first about positive emotion. Um, so what I'm gonna, the structure of the next 10 to 12 minutes, I'm gonna go, go through P, E, R, M, and A. I'm gonna tell you something that you, you probably don't know about them, something the science has learned. And uh, I'll talk some about what we know about building these things. So, uh, uh, Marcel Losada and Barbara Fredrickson go to corporations 
And uh, uh, this is a study of 60 different corporations in the United States. They count, they measure, they listen to the business meetings and they count every word that's said. And they ask, what is the relationship of what people say to the economic status of the, co of the company? And what they find is that in the 20 companies that are flourishing economically, the ratio of positive words to negative words is 2.9 to 1 or greater. Uh, in companies that are stagnating, it's between 1 and 2.9 to 1. And in, in the 20 companies that are going under, it's below 1 that the negative words outweigh the positive words. So interestingly, um, there is something called a Losada ratio that correlates with economic flourishing in American companies. Now, you don't want to take this home to your marriage. Uh, so my friends who I think will be here next week, Julie and John Gottman, lock couples in a apartment for a weekend and they record every word that's said up through nine in the evening and they plot the same thing and they're they're interested in predicting divorce and it turns out there is a losada ratio below which divorce is predicted and it's five to one so uh 2.9 to one is a predictor of divorce in a couple's relationship um What's going on here is we often have to say negative things to people we care about or work with. And the question is, against what level of positivity do people hear us? Now, uh, this is probably different for raising kids. So those of you who have followed the history of positive psychology know that my uh, five-year-old daughter, who's now 20, Nikki, founded positive psychology by telling me I was a grouch in the garden and uh, uh, made me reconsider my ways when I was president of the American Psychological Association. Well, uh, she's uh, uh, 20 now and when, when she was 18 and a senior in high school met, majoring in entitlement, she, uh, uh, <laughs> I, came, I came home excitedly to Mandy and the kids and uh, told them about the Losada ratio and uh, then I went off to work on the computer. And uh, about 11 in the evening, it was a Thursday evening, Nikki came running up and wanted me to drive her to a party. I said, it's a Thursday night, Nikki, I shouted at her. Uh, you know, get to work, do your homework. She looked at me and said, Daddy, you have a terrible Losada ratio. <laughs> which is to say, when we're raising children, what is the ratio at which they hear us? So that's what I want. That's just an example of the kind of research people do in the P of PERMA. Uh, engagement, signature strengths. Uh, when do people go into flow? People typically go into flow when their highest strengths just meet the challenges that they face. And uh, again, on this website, uh, there's a test, a signature strengths test that almost two million people have taken around the world. Uh, takes about 20 minutes. And what it comes out of it is it tells you what your highest strengths are compared to other people like you. And the sort of research, and people have done a lot of research now on what is the relationship of strengths to being a great teacher, to having a good marriage, to being a good parent. This is a, something that you've probably not heard of. I'm uh, very interested in uh, trauma in human beings, and particularly in post-traumatic growth. The question of who grow. So trauma, in, there's a bell-shaped curve about the human reaction to awful events, and I'll talk about combat in about 20 minutes, in which people on the left fall apart and have uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Uh, people in the middle are resilient, that is, after about three months, they come back to where they were. And then there's uh, people who are stronger three months later, uh, a year later. There are often people who go through a terrible time. So on this website, we wanted to know um, who grew after awful events. And uh, what we, we put up uh, 
a, a trauma scale, and in, in about a month, uh, this had the 15 worst things that could happen to a human being. Uh, rape, uh, potentially lethal illness, being tortured, being held captive. And we got 1,700 people who had um, one or more of these things happen. And we asked the question of what are the strengths of people after such events? And it turned out that uh, compared to the rest of us, people who have been through one awful event are stronger than people who have been through none, by our measures. People who have been through two are stronger than people who have been through one. And people who have been through three are stronger than anyone. Uh, and we asked what characteristics predicted that, and uh, uh, it, those five, religiousness, gratitude, kindness, hope, and bravery, were the predictors of who was going to grow the most. Um, and then we asked the question for the subset of uh, serious physical illness. Uh, uh, these are people who have recovered from it. Which character strengths predicted growth? And it was bravery, kindness, and humor. Um, can you change in this dimension? So those of you who, if we were doing this overnight, I would have had you go to the website, take uh, the character strengths, and then uh, uh, I would have given you an assignment. So I'm going to try to do it now. Uh, you haven't taken it, but uh, those of you who don't have your eyes closed already, close your eyes. Uh, think of something that you have to do at work that you don't like doing. Okay, open your eyes. So you're, you've taken the character strengths test and your assignment next week would be to do that task using your highest strength. And uh, uh, let me just give you, uh, oh, I should say something about where I come from about measuring the effect of interventions. So I've spent a lot of my life working on uh, medications and psychotherapy and asking the question what works and what doesn't work. And the gold standard for that is uh, random assignment placebo controlled testing. And that's what I've spent a lot of my life doing. And when about 15 years ago I started working on well-being, I said, well, can we ask the same question? What really makes people lastingly happier? So a lot of what I do in real life is to, uh, on this website, uh, well, I should, let's see, confession. I'm a depressive and a pessimist. I think actually only a pessimist can do serious work on optimism. Uh, I take my own medicine, and when someone has an idea about an intervention, what happens is first I give it to my wife and seven children. If it works, first I do it on myself. If it works on me, I give it to Mandy and the kids. If it works on them, I give it to my graduate students to try out. If it works on them, then we start to do clinical trials on it. And if it works there, then we put it up on the website and uh, we uh, do very large scale testing, which you go to the website, you get the assignment, and the assignment for this one, if you took it, would be uh, what's your highest strength, and then next week to do something you don't like doing using your highest strength. And then we measure you every month for the next six months for depression, anxiety, well-being. So the exercise that I'm talking about now, if you do it on average six months later, uh, you'll be less depressed, less anxious, and have higher well-being. So let me just give you uh, an example here. Uh, one woman I worked with was a waitress, and she didn't like waitressing, so working her way through uh, university, uh, heavy trays, patronizing, being patronized by customers. Uh, she took the signature strength test. Her highest strength was social intelligence. So her job was to do, to recraft waitressing using social intelligence. So she resolved that she would make the encounter with her the social highlight of every customer's evening. Now, 
notice this is she's going to fail at this, but she puts what's best inside of her on offer continually, and waitressing becomes more fun, tips are larger, and the like. So it turns out if you ask what your highest strengths are, and then you take something you don't like doing and use your highest strength to do it, six months later, uh, on average, less depression, less anxiety, better well-being. And very interestingly, I know from looking at at least one of you that one of you, how many of you are therapists or social workers? Okay, well, uh, uh, I've spent a lot of my life being a therapist. Um, one of the difficulties about therapy and the way we measure the effects of psychological interventions and therapy is how long they last before they melt. Uh, by and large, most of the things we do in therapy melt over time. The interesting thing about many of the positive interventions, they're self-reinforcing. So it turns out if kindness is your highest strength and you decide to use it more at work, it turns out that's a self-reinforcing thing. It doesn't, doesn't go away once you start doing it. So these things tend to be addicting in a way the moves in psychotherapy are not. Uh, relationships. Um, how many of you are marriage counselors? Not too many of you, okay. Marriage counseling is the worst form of therapy. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's outcome statistics are abysmal. People are lying to you. They're lying to each other. Uh, sometimes they unite in hating you and then things go a little better. Uh, and uh, when I used to teach couples and sex therapy, um, what you essentially, if you look at the marriage manuals, you teach people how to fight better. Uh, you don't want them to have the same argument every day. Uh, you're essentially trying to make insufferable marriages barely tolerable. <laughs> now, this is not a positive psychology move. The question in positive psychology is how to make a good marriage very good. Um, so, uh, uh, Shelley Gable and a group of marriage counselors at, uh, in California uh, said, let's not look at how people fight Let's look at how they celebrate together and let's see what the consequences are. So it turns out if your, your spouse comes home from work, she's been promoted. What do you say to her? Well, two by two table, active, passive, constructive, destructive. Um, what I used to do until I, and this is what most of you do, until I read this literature was passive constructive which is congratulations dear you deserve it no effect on relationships uh, many people I'm going to tell you about drill sergeants in about 10 minutes do active destructive which is you know what tax bracket that's going to put us into uh, uh, some people do passive destructive which is you know what's for dinner the only thing that works doesn't come naturally and there are now scripts for it it's taught and uh, it's active constructive and that goes something like this uh, uh, darling I've been reading the reports you wrote to the company uh, over the last year that one the one you wrote on the pension plan three months ago the single best fiscal report I've seen in my 25 years in business now exactly where were let's please relive what happened today. Exactly where were you when your boss told you you had been promoted? She tells you. Exactly what did he say verbatim? She tells you. She said, what do you think the real reasons you were promoted are? And so on. And how can you use those strengths in new situations and with the kids and the like? And it turns out when people do that and you teach people to do that, it decreases the probability of divorce and more importantly, it increases the probability of love and commitment. So that's new under the sun. And when, when we talk about schools and organizations, I'll talk more about that. So that's a little bit of relationships. Um, M, meaning. 
belonging to and serving something bigger than you are. Uh, the self is not a very good, impossible medium for meaning. Uh, can you build this? And here's something we do with this. Most of you probably don't need to know this, but your kids need to know this. Um, I assign my students to do something fun next week and to do something philanthropic next week and to record what happens to them emotionally. And it turns out there's a, quite an astonishing regularity about this. So if your kid does something fun next week, like hangs out with her friends or goes to the movies or masturbates, it turns out there is a square wave offset. When it's over, it's over. And that's pretty much the, the, the shape of what uh, uh, fun things do for us. And it's a lot why positive psychology is not about the smiley face. But when you do something philanthropic, something very different occurs. Um, one of my students, uh, her, for this assignment, her third grade nephew called her on the telephone in the week she was working on this. It was midterm week. He needed to be tutored in fractions. So she spent two hours on the phone tutoring him in fractions. And she reported, after that, the whole day went better. Uh, I could listen to people. People liked me more. I, I was mellow. And then one of my, war one of my business students said, um, I'm a business student because I want to make money. And the reason I want to make money is money brings control, security, and happiness. And I was astonished to find out I was happier helping another person than I was shopping. And it turns out the, hedon the human hedonic system is built that way. So for the 10% of you that are depressed right now, I'm often asked, what's the, what's the single short thing you can do when someone is depressed to feel better? And it turns out uh, the, the single best thing you can do immediately is to go out and help someone else. It turns out our hedonic system, I'm not preaching about this, it turns out the hedonic system is built that way. So that's uh, meaning and finally in the middle here, accomplishment. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues, Angela Duckworth, is interested in the question of who never gives up, uh, the, grit, the grit question, and there's a scale for grit. Uh, and it turns out uh, there, there are indeed people who will never give up. And in some corporations, those are the people you want to sell life insurance and the like. But um, we, uh, uh, Angela goes to different settings and measures grit. And I'll just give you, uh, so it turns out uh, the people who don't quit at West Point are the high grit people. Uh, it turns out if you Take, so we're interested in, in school in the relationship between IQ and self-discipline, which is a subset of grit. So we measure IQ and uh, self-discipline in kids, and then we look at grades. And it turns out uh, self-discipline is about twice the predictor of IQ for grades in young people. Uh, do you have spelling bees in Australia? We have these bizarre, I guess you don't have them. So we have two, uh, one million kids every year who are ages uh, seven to about 12 who learn to spell uh, very obscure words uh, in coate and things like that. And they come down to 170, 168 finalists in Washington. And so Angela measured the IQ and the grit of the 168 finalists, two years running. And uh, again, uh, what predicted being a finalist in the spelling bee was grit and self-discipline and not IQ. So that's, uh, so what we've just done is uh, to go through PERMA and uh, look at something about the science and something about how these things are built uh, uh, for a flavor of the individual 
findings on this. So the question I now want to turn to, does this stuff transcend individuals? And is it something that can happen in larger organizations? And um, so uh, uh, the um, sorts of interventions I've been talking about here have been incorporated into something called University of Pennsylvania Vania resilience training, and there are, by the way, about 12 programs in Australia uh, which are related to the building of PERMA, which are also having decent effects. I'm going to talk about the one I know best. In Penn resilience training, which you teach, you go to schools and you teach kids uh, these, uh, there have been now 21 replications across the world involving uh, several thousand students. These are controlled experiments. Uh, they're in very diverse samples, uh, Beijing, the UK, wealthy schools. We do this in, in the poorest schools in the United States and in the, U, in the UK. And importantly, we don't teach the students. We teach the teachers these skills. Uh, we first started out, my graduate students did this in, in classes and it seemed it worked. But we realized that wasn't disseminable. So we developed a 10-day course for teachers and then asked the question, how well do teachers do? And it turns out they do at least as well as my graduate students. So it's, it's disseminable. And in this, kids learn to handle day-to-day -day stressors. They learn realistic optimism. They learn decision-making. And in the 21 replications across the world, uh, uh, over the next year to two, having taught the teachers this, the students statistically, uh, particularly as they go through puberty, have less depression, less anxiety, and higher well-being. That's the texture of the results. Um, and uh, uh, this is happening in, in uh, 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 quite a lot of schools. Uh, in the United States, there are, there are 110 charter schools for poor black kids age uh, kindergarten through uh, year seven. Uh, the other end of the spectrum in the United States, uh, Riverdale, which is a, a, a great country day school. Uh, starting uh, about three and a half years ago, Geelong Grammar began to incorporate this. And uh, right now, and part of the reason we're here, is uh, St. Peter's College here and uh, the Mount Barker High School. Uh, are now starting to incorporate this. And so um, there is uh, data and uh, quite a lot of ongoing work in schools. Um, and uh, as I said, the, the, the data are, are promising here. Less depression, less anxiety, higher well-being statistically. And most importantly, how many of you are teachers? Um, rejuvenating, teaching has a very high burnout rate, as you know. And it turns out there's good reason to believe that when teachers learn these skills, it's rejuvenating for the teachers as well as having an effect on the depression and anxiety of the kids going forward. Um, three years ago, the uh, Chief of Staff of the United States Army called me to the Pentagon, George Casey. Uh, he said post-traumatic stress disorder, divorce, depression, substance abuse, panic. Uh, what does positive psychology say about that, Dr. Seligman? Uh, and, and I said, well, sir, the, and this is what I said 25 minutes ago, the distribution of human beings who encounter awful events like combat is bell-shaped. And on the left-hand side of the bell, you've got people who fall apart, who suffer post-traumatic stress disorder, high suicide rates, uh, and you should continue to spend five to ten billion dollars a year treating those soldiers. But if you are going to send uh, troops to a mosquito-infested area of the world, you wouldn't say, well, if you come back with malaria, we'll give you quinine. Rather, we know things prophylactic about malaria. You clear the swamps, mosquito netting, prophylactic medication. Um, and in that vein, I said the great middle of people are resilient, and then there's a large number of people who show post-traumatic growth. And that means operationally people who often go through a very hard time 
uh, but a year later, by psychological and physical measures, are better off than they were a year before. So my advice, sir, is to try to move the entire distribution toward resilience and growth, and to do it preventively. Whereupon General Casey said uh, two remarkable things. The, the first was he ordered, this is a meeting of the general staff, he ordered, unlike what we all do, he ordered uh, that from that day forward, uh, resilience and positive psychology would be measured and taught throughout the entire 1.1 million person United States Army, and he would create an army that was just as psychologically fit as physically fit. And he allocated about $130 million to it. And then the second thing he said was, we've read your stuff in the schools, and we like that you teach teachers these skills, and the teachers then teach the students, and you measure the students, and you get less depression, anxiety. We've read that stuff. That's the army model. Because we have 40,000 teachers in the army. I said, you do? He said, yeah, the drill sergeants. <laughs> so your job, Dr. Seligman, will be to train all the drill sergeants in the army, and they will train the entire army, and we will measure very carefully whether or not this improves performance, whether or not it decreases suicide, uh, decreases post-traumatic stress disorder, and indeed, uh, that's what they've been doing for about three years now. Uh, there, there are three elements to comprehensive soldier fitness. The first is we had to measure what, what, what is psychological fitness, and that's where I started uh, 35 minutes ago. Uh, uh, how do you measure PERMA? And so the Army created something called the GATT, the global assessment tool, which all 1.1 million soldiers now take once a year. And uh, 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 it's a measure, most psychological tests are tests of misery and disorder. This is a test of what you're good at, about uh, emotional fitness, social fitness, family fitness, uh, and meaning and purpose in life. And so uh, we've been getting data now for over two years and asking the question, what does it predict? And um, I have permission to show you some of this. Um, this is a, a, there are 1,200 colonels in the United States Army every year, uh, and thir 33 of them are promoted to brigadier general. So the question is, can you predict who's going to get promoted to Brigadier General? And the answer is, you sure can. Those of you who do statistics here, when you look at these correlations, it turns out you can predict um, more than just casually who's going to make it from Colonel to Brigadier General. Uh, that's one kind of data that's come out of this. Uh, uh, now. Question is, so the, the, the second part of comprehensive soldier fitness is every month 180 drill sergeants come to the University of Pennsylvania. And my faculty essentially teaches them the skills that I've been alluding to. And the question is, does this work? And so the Army has now been measuring the troops underneath the drill sergeants who have had training uh, in positive psychology and PERMA. And um, these are some of the data they've been finding. Uh, here you measure, uh, this is catastrophic thinking in many soldiers, either who did or did not have a drill sergeant who taught uh, resilience and positive psychology, and it's through deployment in Iraq and Afghanistan. So this is the real stuff. Uh, so what you find is in, in the the uh, soldiers that have been trained statistically, uh, catastrophic thinking uh, uh, goes down compared to the soldiers that have not had uh, uh, resilience training. Uh, positive coping goes up through deployment and adaptability goes down. And um, I know there are some of you here who work on suicide, so I actually have permission to show a teeny bit of the data. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, this is all the soldiers in Korea. And um, uh, for the last year and a half, uh, they've been, uh, the drill sergeants have been training more and more of them in resilience training. And this is the percentage of suicide, 
suicidal gestures, suicidal ideation. And it turns out about uh, 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 78% of the people who have not had positive psychology training, 78% uh, of the suicidal material is accounted for by the people who have not had training. So this is the first stuff we've seen on uh, uh, suicide. Okay, I'm coming to the, my last eight or ten minutes. Um, I want to talk now. So there's evidence that uh, this training is effective in schools and effective statistically in the army. Um, this is the question of, of nations. So those of you who follow British and French politics uh, may know that quite boldly, uh, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, announced a, a year and a half ago that uh, he, he had campaigned on the notion that uh, global well-being should be the aim of government and that he would measure well-being across the UK and most importantly hold himself accountable for public policy by changes in well-being as well as changes in, DD, in GDP. So um, uh, every uh, three months uh, the, the statistical group in Britain makes 200,000 phone calls and they ask people at random the well-being and PERMA questions and um, um, we're involved in the question of whether or not there's one indicator, life satisfaction, or whether or not one wants a dashboard of indicators. So in, if you're a pilot, there's no one number that tells you the well-being of an airplane. Rather, it depends on the mission. Sometimes it's the fuel gauge, sometimes it's the wind speed, the altimeter, and the interaction of those. And we believe that human well-being is this perma-dashboard. So what one not wants is not just life satisfaction, but positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. Um, and we want to combine subjective and objective indicators of well-being. So that's where the measurement of well-being is now. And I'll say a little bit about South Australia in this context. In uh, So... Um, I think what really brings me to South Australia and what I'm most excited about uh, is the possibility that an entire state, not just an entire school, could take well-being seriously. The question is, in, in what would that consist? Well, this is what it looks like to me. First, I think we want to measure the PERMA, the well-being of every child, every young person in South Australia. And the reason we want to do that is first informative, but then ask, when you do interventions in the school or interventions in the state, what is its effect on the well-being of youth? Uh, now, uh, I, your, your Prime Minister, Jay Witherell, and I have a very similar vision about this. Uh, and that's uh, the question of whether or not you can immunize young people psychologically. Now, what I've really been saying this evening is that there are interventions uh, that have been shown to work statistically in young people and adults that increase well-being, and that these interventions lower the probability of depression and anxiety and might even have an effect on something as awful as suicide. So the vision here is, can we bring the Australian and American programs to bear on young people in the schools for parents to learn as well, to immunize young people. Uh, and what we're after here is uh, not just positive mental health, not just uh, increases in PERMA, decreases in depression and anxiety, but I'm not going to have time tonight to do it, but we'll be doing it in, I think, our third event. Uh, there's very interesting reason to think that physical health as life goes on, is intimately related to the PERMA variables. And so, uh, looking at the age of the men in this audience, uh, uh, about half of you are likely to die of cardiovascular stuff. Uh, and there are these giant industries of blood pressure and cholesterol and the like. So there are quite a lot of people now in epidemiology who 
and this is sort of what we're involved in doing, who take the risk factors for cardiovascular death, we hold those statistically constant, and we ask, if you have high subjective well-being, if you have a good marriage, if you have positive biological indicators, does that protect you against cardiovascular death over and above the risk factors? And the answer is, uh, and I use the word robustly here, robustly, yes, for cardiovascular disease. And we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. But part of this question of immunizing youth is not just the question of increasing mental health, but in the long run of healthcare expenditure and decreasing morbidity uh, and perhaps mortality. And what's so exciting to us about being in South Australia is uh, this could be a prototype for the world. That is, if never been done in an entire state to measure the well-being of all the kids than to do interventions and to ask what is the effect on well-being. And so if we can do this in South Australia and it works, then it's the prototype for the, I believe, the mental and physical health for uh, the planet. Uh, finally, um, I started by asking the question, what can you hope for in life most? And uh, uh, in many ways, this is the global well-being versus uh, GDP question. And uh, the question of what, what is wealth in the service of? My economist friends, by and large, believe that wealth is in the service of more wealth. My belief is that wealth is in the service of well-being. Uh, and uh, uh, Most of human history, uh, plague, poverty, uh, war, uh, uh, public policy asks about defense and damage. Uh, and uh, there are instances of, hum of human history in which nations are wealthy and not at war and not in famine and not in civil turmoil. Florence of 1450 is a excellent example of this. Uh, as you know, Florence by about 1450 had become terrifically wealthy, mostly through Medici banking genius, and it asked the question, what shall we do with this wealth? And it's an open debate. Uh, the generals advocated that they should conquer the peninsula, uh, but uh, under the leadership of Cosimo the Elder, it was decided that Florence would invest its wealth in beauty. It gave us what 200 years later people called the Renaissance. Now, I'm not suggesting that uh, the European Union, uh, North America, Australia should go out and do sculpture at this point. Rather, I'm suggesting that we now know something about well-being and that we can, I think we're at a Florentine moment in the wealthy nations of the world. And what I'm after is that we use our treasure to build not the wealth, but the well-being of citizens, the perma of citizens. Uh, and so the theme of what I've tried to say tonight is that we, it, it's often uh, uh, glibly said by our economist friends that our children are likely to be poorer than we are, to have less money than we are. I'm not an economist, I don't know whether or not that's true, but there is good reason to think that our children can have more well-being than we do. And so when we think about our own lives and what we can hope for, for ourselves, for our children, for this state and for this nation, I think what we can hope for is more well-being. And, and so in summary, what, what I've, when we think about left versus right in politics, that for me is mostly an argument about given the ends that uh, uh, the body politics wants, more wealth, military conquest, uh, more of a safety net, who should do it? Should, should it be the government or individuals who do it? Uh, I'm suggesting that what is political here is that there's a different end, that the end of good government, 
The end of a good individual life, the end of good schooling, of good parenting, is more well-being. Uh, uh, Nietzsche, uh, looking over the course of human history, said uh, there were three epochs of human history. The, the first he called the camel, and the camel just sits there and moans. Uh, and uh, Nietzsche said that's most of human history. And the second he called uh, the lion or the rebel. And the rebel says no. The rebel says no to slavery, no to plague, no to Sharia, no, no to killing. Um, and I think you have to be blinded by ideology not to see that in the last 300 years, the politics of saying no has worked hasn't worked perfectly, but almost every awful thing we care about has a lower probability than it did 300 years ago. By the way, the book of the year for me was Steven Pinker's book, for those of you who haven't read it, The Better Angels of Our Nature, which is about this giant decrease in violence over the last 500 years. Um, what is it that, it, what goals, what is it that every human being can say yes to? Uh, Nietzsche says the third phase of human history is the child reborn. And that's not the... Po he, he asks, what if the politics of no actually worked? And we could make inroads into these awful things. Slavery, discrimination, plague, racism. Uh, what can we say yes to? And what I've tried to say tonight, this evening, is that I think we can say... Every human being can say yes to more positive emotion in life. Every human being can say yes to more engagement with the people you love at work and your leisure. Every human being can say yes to more purpose and meaning in life. Every human being can say yes to better relationships. And every human being can say yes to more positive accomplishment. So in summary, what I've tried to say this evening is that the notion of well-being is measurable, it's buildable, we can say yes to it, and it is our hope for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Seligman. That was wonderful. Can I ask you to come down and join me on the floor? Dr. Seligman would like to take a few questions. Uh, we're just going to invite people to come down on this side only and come to this microphone. Of course, we'll only be able to take about 10 questions maximum, I'd say, and we will be taking some questions from the online connection over the internet. So if anyone's got a question for Dr. Seligman, we've got until quarter to eight, or just before then, to handle a few questions. I realise it's not easy to get to the microphone from within this theatre style of uh, uh, arrangement we have here, but let's see whether there's any questions. A few people rushing home to feed the kids, we understand that. <clears throat> so has anyone got some questions? Yes, please. Would you like to come to the microphone here? I Thank you for see, being brave. I can brave. see the problem here, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's always harder yeah. when you're the first one I, in a... Could I give him in. a microphone? Would uh, that work? He, he, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Oh, no, it's connected to that. Yeah. Dr. Seligman, I'm wondering if you can explain for us what you mean in your writings about you don't do, you don't do disadvantage. Um, could you hear the question really about disadvantage? Um, I've sp I've spent almost my first 35 years of my life uh, working on the worst things in life on poverty, on suicide, on depression, on, on victims, on post-traumatic disorder. And so the change in positive psychology is uh, the question of well-being. And then the question is, does well-being redound to everyone? And um, here's a metaphor for doing it. So I'm quite interested in chronic pain. 
and there are many people who live with uh, chronic pain. Uh, I'll use it as a paradigm of disadvantage. It, 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 um, I'm a, a serious bridge player, and the average bridge player in the United States is now around 70 years old. Uh, so when I play bridge, I'm very often dealing with people who are in pain arthritis, rheumatism, and worse, they're not in pain when they play bridge. <laughs> they're in pain in between hands and in between sessions. So we take um, uh, undergraduates, we take their shoes and socks off. We have them put uh, a foot in ice cold water. And we ask, keep your foot in the water for as long as you can. Uh, and on average, uh, healthy undergraduates around 80 and 90 seconds before it becomes unbearable pain. If you give undergraduates video games to play, if you put them in flow, they keep their feet in ice water for about four minutes on average. Uh, this is all metaphor for saying that positive psychology is done in, not only in wealthy schools like uh, Geelong Grammar, uh, uh, St. Peter's College, but it's done in the poorest schools in the, Uni in the United States and Australia. And there is good reason to believe that these, that well-being is everyone's right. And uh, it has the interesting, of, if that one can justify working on well-being uh, for its own sake, that we all want it. But interestingly, it seems to combat many of the ills, perhaps in, in better ways than hitting the ills directly. In American football, we call that end, an end run. So the question is, can, can we have an end run around the things we care the most about, disadvantage, that we haven't done very well with by hitting it head on? Can we do an end run by building well-being in people who are disadvantaged? Thank you very much. Could I have the next question, please? Can I see a show of hands? Can everyone hear up the back there? Thank yes. you. Um, I've really enjoyed tonight. I guess um, I have a, a, quite a multifaceted question. Um, I work in both the public and the government sector. Um, in the government sector, with children and families mainly, um, our waiting lists just recently have blown out to inordinate proportions, um, unmanageable. Um, in the private sector, because of our federal government's re reduction in funding, um, a lot of these people have very complex and multi-tiered problems and the 10 sessions are just not enough to even touch the surface. Um, I, we rely so much on media these days. Is there a way of delivering some of this positive psychology through advertisements, 30-second um, grabs on television, um, uh, lifestyle programs that reach out and touch some of our more disadvantaged and middle people who may not have the finances to be able to seek a private psychologist yep. or something? And, you know, it's fascinating, but how do, how, do we, how do we actually reach the majority of our state? Because I look around and we've got a full thing, but we're all probably middle to upper class and a bit more privileged, and I think the people that really need this the most are probably the people who aren't here tonight. Right. And I, I guess I'm directing this also to our Premier and um, our Minister for Health, and if, and even our federal ministers for health, and if this is a political situation, how do we reach the right. majority? Right. Um, well, uh, the first thing I want to say is I don't think there's a quick fix to well-being. So I don't think uh, telling people be happy and have refrigerator stickers and telling people to do affirmations mm. does very much about well-being. But there are effective, large-scale interventions for well-being. It can be taught. There are programs that do it, uh, both in Australia and the United States. And uh, your CEO, uh, 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 Keith Bartley, and I have been asking the question, is there a way of creating master's degrees, teaching 
uh, degrees in which, in the same way that we teach our teachers to teach geometry, there's reason to think we can teach our teachers and our social workers and our mental health workers to teach PERMA. So the question is, can we create um, relatively inexpensive, sustainable, and indigenous programs in Australia which will bring well-being to um, every child uh, in Australia. And uh, it is why I'm here, and I think it's, it's, it's a real possibility. Thank you very much. Dr. Sellingman, you have a, um, a vision for positive psychology. By the year 2051, we'll have 51% of the population flourishing. And tonight you've given us, I guess, a reason to have hope that that's possible. You've given us um, some tools. You've told us you know, what we can do. I'm just curious about where you see the resistance coming from, why we, why we can't do that. What, what are the obstacles? Are they, are they national? Are they political? Are they economic? Um, well, it's a very important question, and I mostly think about individuals. So it's a, a new adventure for me to think about large organizations and the body politics. But part, part of the issue is the political will. Will, how can we go from programs in which schools and individuals uh, build well-being to uh, national well-being and planetary well-being? I think uh, the political agenda is part of that, and it's very interesting to me that Cameron and Sarkozy mm -hmm. have both taken these as part of their political agenda. Uh, uh, but more than that, uh, I think the social media and video games are a very important part of the future of well-being. So while I don't think there are refrigerator stickers that make people happier, there are, uh, there's a movement called uh, Games for Health. Mm -hmm. And there are several hundred people around the world who, instead of doing shoot 'em up games, are building perma games. So we talked about active constructive responding. Well, it turns out you can make a game out of getting better and better at active constructive responding. So I believe the gamification of well being uh, will also uh, uh, help. But half the world's population is India and China. Uh, and and uh, the question is, as uh, India and China get wealthier and wealthier, we're seeing an increase in depression and anxiety. And the question is, in, in these great nations, uh, will they take on well-being as an agenda? Uh, so that's, that's my first approximation to the possibility that, that uh, uh, in the year 2051, the majority of adults in this world planet uh, could have high perma. Okay, I'd like to just read a question from the webinar, the online audience. Um, we have one question here. Can Dr. Seligman comment on whether can Dr. Seligman comment on whether there are genetic influences on resilience uh, and the perma principles? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, it depends on each element of perma and let me go through them. Uh, there are quite strong genetic influences on how smiley you can be. Uh, so it, it turns out there is a, that being bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and smiling and feeling cheerful are uh, a, a fairly genetic. At least 50% of the variance is genetic for uh, positive emotion. And what that means is for those of us who want to increase positive emotion, uh, you've got about 10 to 15 percent. You can live in the upper range of, if you will, your set range for the smiley face. So that's part one. There, we know of pretty heritability of, of P. Engagement, uh, going into flow, uh, being one with the music. We don't know of any genetic constraints on flow. There may be, but no one's discovered them. So that becomes a very interesting possibility for intervention. And we know, uh, due to the work of Cheeks and Mihai and others, that you can have more flow in life when you know what your highest strengths are and you deploy them to meet your highest challenges. Um, 
the R, relationships. Uh, what are the genetic constraints on relationships? Well, there probably are such. Uh, the extrovert-introvert dimension is one of them that's quite heritable, heritable indeed. But it is interesting that introverted people, people who uh, don't naturally do active constructive responding, can actually learn how to do this more. So I believe even if you're like me on, in the lower half of, uh, ex, in the introverted part uh, of the spectrum, there are techniques that I've learned and can teach that increase the quality of relationships, uh, meaning in life. Uh, I don't think there, I think meaning is every person's right. The uh, finding something that you believe in, belonging to it and serving it. As far as I know, there are no genetic constraints on that. The A, accomplishment. Uh, indeed, there are high genetic constraints on IQ. Uh, people have argued it's up to 75% heritable. But interestingly, we're finding that things like grit and self-discipline, which as far as we know, uh, we don't know genetic constraints are, are at least as important as IQ, probably more for uh, success. So that's... Uh, Thank you very much, Martin. Can we have another question from the audience? Thanks for your presentation, Dr. Sedigman. It was very interesting. Uh, um, can, can you hear? Could you lean into the microphone? Right. Um, I would like to get back to the political. You say well-being is something political. Uh, research shows, and I don't know whether you're aware of the book, The Spirit Level, by a UK researcher called Wilkinson, I forget his, his first name, shows that more equal societies have a higher level of well-being overall. Can you um, elaborate on that a bit? And Denmark shows it, for example. Yeah. 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 Um, it's very controversial literature, and there's very conflicting evidence about it. So uh, the evidence that I take most seriously about inequality in societies is uh, what's called the World Database of Happiness that Root uh, Wienhoven in Erasmus in the Netherlands does. So what this literature does is for uh, more than 100 nations, it looks at the index of inco income inequality and then it looks at uh, life satisfaction measures, pretty much the P measure. And in that literature, interestingly enough, there's very, only very small effects of income inequality across the world on life satisfaction measures. There are other studies which make the claim and it accounts for uh, a noticeable but not huge part of the variance. So when I average across this pretty complex literature, it looks to me that income inequality ha may have small effects on well-being, but not huge effects on well-being. Thank you very much. Can I have the next question? Hello, Professor Seligman. It's, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm mm -hmm. Melinda Steenkamp. And um, I um, come from an epidemiology background. And I'm just thinking that this is coming from a very Western perspective. And what are your thoughts on how do you apply this to Aboriginal Australians? Because, I mean, we know that their well-being is much lower, their health is much dire than right, mainstream right. Australia. And um, the, the answer is that I, I don't know. It is interesting that uh, when the uh, uh, resilience programs are done in the UK and the United States in very poor communities, that their effects are uh, uh, significant. And we haven't seen, uh, if you will, a wealth and privilege difference in the effects of these interventions on well-being variables. As far as I know, um, I haven't seen data on Aboriginal populations and resilience programs and PERMA programs, but I, I, I hope the future will, will uh, try it out and, and see, if, see how it does. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. There was a question also from the Twitter sphere. A couple of tweets have asked the question, <clears throat> maybe it's from someone in here, how do you respond to the cynics about positive psychology? Um, well, it, it uh, depends on, on which aspect you're cynical about. Um, so let me take some of the best criticisms of positive psychology. Um, so one is that we already know it. And I tried to go through 
examples for each of PERMA, things uh, I didn't know 15 years ago that the science has brought about. Um, another criticism is, look, what, and this is something like I think what you raised, look, what we really care about in the body politic is uh, disadvantage, victims, misery, and suffering. And um, indeed, I think that's a very important criticism. Uh, and it is interesting that the positive interventions seem to have effects. So uh, I think positive interventions and in well-being are justifiable in their own right, that Schopenhauer and Freud were really wrong about that, and we can have more of these things. But if all you cared about in life was misery and suffering, there is pretty good reason to think that the positive variables battle misery and suffering. So that's a second kind of criticism. Um, a third one is you really don't want people to be happy because they'll become bad citizens. And that happy people don't care about the world. This is indeed the theme of Barbara Ehrenreich's very interesting book uh, called uh, 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 Bright Sided, which she argues against positive psychology. Um, and um, uh, so it turns out there are about 20 studies on uh, good Samaritan generosity, philanthropy, altruism in depressed and non-depressed people. So 19 of the 20 show that non-depressed people are more altruistic than depressed people. Uh, goes in the other, and I've spent my life working on depression, and, and many of you know the phenomenon intimately. Uh, depression, one of its hallmark symptoms is self-absorption. So when we're depressed, me becomes really important. And very interestingly, there is reason, I think, to believe that when you increase people's well-being, they become better citizens, more volunteering, more philanthropic. So those are three or four of the, the uh, uh, criticisms of positive psychology. I am ones I take seriously, ones to which there are answers, and maybe some of you have more lethal criticisms than that. Thank you, Dr. Seligman. Next question, please. We've probably only got time for two more. Uh, good evening, Dr. Seligman. Fuzzy Trojan is my name. Uh, I think of Abraham Maslow as something of a forebear to your work. Uh, he came up with the um, hierarchy of needs, and I just wonder if you'd like to reflect upon the connection between yeah, yeah, what indeed. you do and what he did, particularly the peak of the, the, the triangle well, self-actualization. Well, right. Uh, sort of two comments on, on Maslow. Uh, he was president of the American Psychological Association about 40 years before, or 30 years before I was. And um, um, one of his research assistants wrote me recently and said what Maslow wanted most was that B.F. Skinner would return his phone calls. <laughs> 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 and Skinner didn't. Now, um, this was a way of saying that Maslow, uh, I think, was there before his time. That uh, uh, what Maslow wanted was an integration of thinking about what is positive in life with the science of psychology. And he didn't, it, science didn't invite him in, basically. So uh, w one of the things that I've worked hard to do is to mainstream, to link uh, Maslowian premises <coughs> to uh, uh, routine, replicable, controlled science. So that, that's part one. So that's my agreement with Maslow. Now, my disagreement with Maslow is the hierarchy. And, uh, and uh, here's the disagreement. It basically says that you can't self-actualize unless you've got the other four levels. Uh, security, self-esteem, biological, safety, all taking place. Now, um, I don't think this is true, and I think it's morally insidious. So, uh, some of my, you know, I've worked on suicide and some of, I work on uh, uh, ethnic murder, ethno-political warfare, and uh, Rwanda and issues of that sort. If you think suicidal people and 
the people of Rwanda only cared about the lower things in the hierarchy. I don't think you don't know suicide or Rwanda. People in Rwanda care enormously about uh, the future of their children. Uh, suicidal people aren't just trying to end their misery. They care enormously about larger entities. So that's a, a, a brief way of trying to say, I think all of us uh, are about self-actualization. Well-being is about self-actualization. And while poverty and lack of safety and lack of self-esteem can get in the way, these are still very possible for, for, for every human being. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much. Sir, Thank we've you. only got one minute for your question, but I will take your question, just last question. Good evening, Dr Seligman. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the ethical implications of teaching positive psychology to US troops. Good. Yeah. By, by, uh, sorry, yeah, I'm um, sorry by, I've set the one sorry. minute time frame on that, but <laughs> <laughs> we are at quarter to eight. By, so, yeah. by making it easier on them and reducing post-traumatic stress disorder, could that not be facilitating the misery of people in foreign countries? Good. Yes, I'm glad you asked that. So, um, I have three brief things to say about that. Uh, so one justification for increasing the well-being of soldiers is to decrease suicide, misery, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, so that's one justification. Um, a, uh, a second ju justification is uh, uh, I've been astonished by actually meeting a huge number of soldiers and generals and sergeants. I've been going to faculty meetings for 45 years. I've never met a faculty member I would trust my life to. Uh, I have met hundreds of young men and women I would now trust my life to and the life of my family. So that's the second part. And the third part, and this is where we may disagree, and I think it's good to have the disagreement come out in the open. Um, uh, I'm Many people view the United States Army uh, as uh, uh, a war machine. I, I view it as one of the great peace machines in the world. Uh, and uh, speaking personally, my uh, uh, grandparents and great-grandparents were uh, persecuted unto death in Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm enormously grateful to uh, ANZAC and uh, the United States for uh, what they did. And my gratitude r remains. And so, uh, sp speaking frankly, uh, working with these young men and women has probably been the most gratifying thing I've ever done in my life. Thank you very much, Thanks. Dr. Sullivan. I'm so sorry we don't have more time to take more questions and I thank you for your questions everybody and everybody who's watching online, thank you for yours too. We're going to wrap up now very quickly and I just wanted to let you know that uh, there are two conferences happening this month with Dr Seligman as the keynote speaker in both conferences as part of this residency. This is a fee paying event but there are places available. Uh, on the 24th of February is the Science of Wellbeing Conference, examining the role of positive psychology in promoting mental and physical health through the stories of practitioners and the cutting edge research happening in the field. While on the 27th of February, the Wellbeing Before Learning Conference will explore the theoretical and practical approaches to embed positive psychology into schools and to into early childhood services. And we also have as a free event as part of the residency, but I'm afraid it's booked out, um, an event at St Peter's College in Adelaide, uh, on the 14th of February, uh, which is completely booked out, and I believe there's a waiting list for that. And am I right, uh, Simon, it's 1,100 people in your hall? 1,300 people. So the response to Martin Seligman in this residency has been unprecedented in my experience as part of the Adelaide Thinkers in Residence. I'm so thrilled you have shown this interest and I'm so thrilled that so many of you have come to listen to the opening lecture of Dr Seligman. This residency has two parts, one month now in February this year and then February of next year. So we will be able to welcome Dr Seligman back and of course the work has just begun. So now if I could just ask you to give a round of applause to Dr Seligman for tonight. Thank you.